So what lies ahead for the Ottawa Senators following our loss to the New York Islanders? The answer is, well, nothing, nothing great. Last episode was a little bit controversial, I would say. Of course, the goaltending wasn't abysmal, but it wasn't where we needed it to be with Darcy Kemper's 917, I believe. Indeed, a 917 save percentage for Darcy. Defensively, you know, bottom line, our depth was a little bit thin. Of course, we went with Asperat. He was okay, but with LeJoie going down to injury, that really didn't help. And of course, someone like Shabbat, we haven't been able to get the most out of because of the coaching difference. That situation doesn't help. And then you look at the forwards. Matthew Kachuk wasn't quite what we wanted him to be. Taylor Hall struggled in the goal scoring department. I bring back Lafreniere. Controversially put him on the fourth line. He doesn't do a thing. Uh, you know, played almost 10 minutes a game. So, hey, Naslin can succeed in that role, but Lafreniere can't. Interesting. Uh, Dylan Larkin and Tyler Toffoli have basically punched their tickets off of uh, this team. It's going to be a very, very interesting off season for us. So we're going to get down to business and figure out just what exactly this team is going to look like heading in to next season. It's not the most ideal situation to be in because, of course, it's not to say we had cup aspirations, but in a way we did as Anaheim ends up winning the Stanley Cup. Now, here is the crucial thing. Maximum salary cap for this season is 94.5 million dollars the floor as you can see is 73.2 so our max spending budget is 78.2 million and the most that we can spend on a contract is going to be uh, it's pretty simple but damn it i don't feel like doing math right now uh what are we doing yeah we're doing 10 percent <laughs> We're doing 10%, so $9.45 million. That's pretty straightforward. I said I didn't feel like doing math. I am incredibly embarrassed because I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. And part of me is like, is that what it is? I think the concern is not wanting to make a mistake and feeling like we've already made mistakes in the past with this team in certain ways. Now, we get a look at the lottery results. Boston has the number one pick. Love to see it. Not really because that means they were garbage. Obviously, we don't have a pick in play at that stage. But what I do want to look at here, and actually we'll take a look at what happened around the league first, how the playoffs went down, the awards and everything, before uh, we jump into seeing what's going on here. But obviously, right now, I'm antsy to get to this draft. As Anaheim beat the New York Islanders in five games in a Battle of New York, at least lower New York. Sorry, Buffalo. Battle of New York, though, that the Islanders beat uh, the Rangers four. They could not turn that into a Stanley Cup victory. Uh, just a quick look at the Ducks at this point. You know, when Jakob Silverberg, former Sen, is going to be able to perform like that, it is pretty, 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 pretty disappointing. And you see their defense. Not sure, of course, who's there and who isn't. And John Gibson played lights out. That would explain it. So looking here, the cup back to the Western Conference. McDavid wins the Art Ross and the Hart. The Norris goes to Adam Fox. Caller to Marchenko. Sam Steele actually won the Colin Smythe, which is kind of crazy. Drysdale to Masterton. Jack Adams to San Jose's head coach. Barrett Hayton wins a Selkie, which is kind of crazy. Hell of a season for Connor McDavid. Down the AHL, Carl Soderberg picked up the most points. Easy for me to say. Was league MVP. First off, the uh, goal-scoring king as well as the top rookie. I think that's Michael Vukasevich. I think it's Michael. It might not even be Michael. I love his hair, though. Uh, Defenseman of the Year, Jack LaFontaine. Top goaltender, Philip Larson, was the MVP of the playoffs. So with that, we do focus on the task at hand. And we look here first, of course, when it comes to the re-sign phase. We are only allowed to bring players back that want to be here. If they want to go, they must go. We need to work on this Lafreniere re-signing. And goaltending-wise, I'd love to bring back Prosvetov after the season that he had. And there's pretty much no reason to not sign him for exactly that. Of course, we're looking at 85% trick only for team-friendly deals. Prosvetov certainly will be coming back. Uh, Yunus Korpisalo is an extremely interesting option because when he played, he was spectacular for us. So if we look at our goaltending, 
Kemper Persvetov, Corpusalo, and then Wallstead, Shogard, Bednar. But we have to sign Tapita as well. Hmm. Yeah, Corpusalo's got to go. If we're re signing Persvetov, which we are, Corpusalo's got to go. So Kemper, Persvetov, and Wallstead, Shogard, Dapita, Bednar. That is the way to go. So I hate to say it, but Jonas is, uh, he's out the door here. Yeah, so trigger has gone too. Defensively, Mark Borbieski doesn't want to come back again. Shocker. Uh, Max Lajoie doesn't want to come back. So every single one of those defensemen are going to be dropped. And then forward-wise, we have to get this Lafreniere contract out of the way right here and right now. And the question is, how long can I sign him for? 7.2 is not bad. 7.25, we'll do the 85%. Basically, can we lock up Lafreniere for 6.175? Which will be worth it because if we only sign him for the two years, you know, the amount he's going to be worth is going to be a lot higher than that. So we're going to see if Lafreniere is willing to accept that contract. Dylan Larkin's going to go. No room really for Tyler Toffoli here. And of course in the playoffs, he really struggled. In the regular season, he had 10 points with us in 19 games. He's out. Formanton. We might as well try to get this deal done as well. I'd prefer to drop it to a two-year deal. And with the 85%, 2-2-2-5. A lot of twos. Drake Batherson going to get an opportunity to stay. Try to get him on a one-year deal. And if we do the 85% trick for him, that's 185. Pretty good contract for him. And then, of course, Paquette, Carlson, Brown going to be dropped. Otto Koivula, it makes sense to bring him back. Mark Kastelich, who uh, lost his spot on the fourth line, makes sense to bring him back. Uh, even Bellarive can bring him back just to see what happens. Uh, Matthew Perot, though, Brian Boyle, Scott Sabrin, I do want to bring back. I don't think we'll drop Sabrin. And from there, we are okay, as long as these contract offers go through, which no guarantees that they will, but hey, we can see what happens. As retirement will be coming up here, Castellich signs. He's the only one. And we'll go to player retirement here as Joe Thornton leads the way. Eric Stahl, Stashny, Louis Erickson, Milan Lucic. Defensively, Latang, Yandel, Giordano. A couple of the big names, Johnny, Boytuck, Johnny Boychuk. And then goaltending-wise, Craig Anderson goes back to Colorado and retires. Amongst other uh, former Sens goaltenders who might have been better than Kemper. Maybe not. Tough to say. It's Thornton, Yandel, and Giordano all become coaches. Will any of them be the next coach of this team? Probably not. Oh, boy. Okay, draft interviews I'm not as worried about. The question here, though, as we get to draft day, as always, comes down to which of our picks uh, one Eugene Melnick is going to get in this draft. One of our top five picks. Once we finalize what selections that I want, he gets one of those picks, which always complicates everything. <laughs> so let's do it. I thank God it gives you a second chance. I thought I'd like quick sim past the draft there. Talk about disasters. So, first and foremost, first and foremost, as far as who's out here, or really as far as our draft picks, 19th, 24th, 50th, 79th, and 81st. So, we're set up decently well in this draft. You could argue Kemper's value to the team. Let's try to sh uh, try to shop Drieger and Corpusalo here. Just to see if there's anything we can get. And there is something we can get for Corpusala. Uh, a sixth and a seventh from Tampa. No reason to not accept that again. I just don't have the space to bring him back. Defensively. Oh boy. Let's try to swap le shop Le Joie. Easy for me to say. Uh, he doesn't want to re-sign. Which sucks because I'd love to keep him. It's going to be a third and a fourth. And I guess I'm going to take that 82nd overall pick there. From Carolina for Lajoie. 
Don't plan on keeping Feder Gurdiv. Can I get anything for him? The answer is no. We'll keep Gwinnett, uh, Gleason, Leabushkin. Doubt we get anything for these guys. Yeah, it's not going to happen. So we've already exhausted our defensive options. Mark Borowiecki, can I shop him? The answer is yes. Two sevenths, a sixth from Colorado, sixth and a seventh from a New York team. Right, let's go back this way, and I will take the slightly higher draft picks on the New York Rangers. I'm going to shop Mark Borowiecki. He doesn't want to stay. I know people are saying try to sign him no matter what, but he's going to be stupidly expensive, so just hopefully the Rangers don't sign him. Like, I'm not... <laughs> I get the whole point was like, oh, keep him no matter what. I'm not paying Mark Borowiecki a million dollars over asking price just to keep him. That's just not going to happen. Sorry. But not sorry. Uh, for the wingers here, oh god, Taylor Hall, are you still going to be on this team by the time this offseason ends? I don't know the answer to that. For the wingers, is Matthew Kachuk still going to be on this team by the time this season ends? We're going to try to shop Tyler to Foley here. Fourth and a fifth seems to be the going rate. And indeed it is, 101 overall from, what was that, Buffalo? Yeah, we'll take that deal from the Buffalo Sabres. Tyler Toffoli on the move again. See if we can get anything for Dustin Brown. The answer is no. Name value does nothing for us there. And then for the centers, I don't know if Colin White and Logan Brown will still be on this team. Not a clue. Really have no idea, but we're going to try to shop Dylan Larkin here. Let's see if we can recoup anything, considering he's going to end up being a rental and a third-round pick from Montreal, a third and a fourth. It's a pretty good bit of business in terms of recouped assets. Dylan Larkin's gone. That is a damn shame that he ended up just being a rental, but he underperformed in the playoffs, and then he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to resign. So there's nothing I can do. My hands are tied. We had to get rid of him for something. So those are all the moves that I can afford to make. The Bruins, with the number one pick, take a medium elite G. Hull, uh, Gary Hull. So it's already fourth line worthy. Nobody in the top of this draft, except for Washington, wants to trade their selection. I don't even know if we have the ability to move up to seven, but there is someone like Albert Hancock who's going to be insane. So trying to make a move... God, our scouts are the worst. Oh, they're so bad. Whew, those scouting limitations are brutal. Let's see if we can work out a deal here with Washington for the uh, seventh overall pick, which could still be made by Eugene. I don't think I have the value to get this. I'm not giving up Kemper or Wallstead yet. Defensively, I can't give anybody up out of that top four. I don't think we have the value to do it. Especially with all the prospects that we've lost. I think this draft, rather than like one major prospect, we need to you know recoup some assets a little bit. Not that we're hurting for forward prospects, though, now that I look at it. You know, do we move... I think it would be Logan Brown. I think it would be Logan Brown and two firsts for the seventh overall pick. You can argue how well that's worth it. I don't know if it is. But that's pretty much the asking price that we're looking at. So if we go back to the draft board, the question then becomes, towards the end of the first round, who's available? And there is a medium elite, Stuart Flaherty. He's not going to be as good, but that's a good value for money pick. Gabriel LaRose is there. Tomas Franzen. There are some pretty damn good players in this draft. We're not going to have the highest overalls towards the bottom. But because of that, I don't think there's a reason to trade up and use all of our assets just to get someone like Hancock with the 7th pick. So we're going to play it conservatively. Let's go ahead and sim or not. Gotta love menu lag. Let's go ahead and sim this Vegas pick. And it's Braden Yeager. And with that, we're gonna find out what pick 
will be uh, you know Eugene's in this draft. Oh boy, so we have the 19th overall selection, the 24th, the 50th, 79th, and 81st. One of those five selections is going to be the pick that Eugene Melnick gets to decide, and it's going to be the 24th, our second highest value pick, the Edmonton pick, is Melnick's. So I get the first selection, but then it's up to Eugene. And that is a scary, scary thought, but we are locked in to making this happen. So let's do it. We'll send to the 19th overall pick. And you see some of the talent that is still available here. Still some pretty high-rated players. Connor Bedard fell to 10th. Jesus. I don't know. Maybe trading up to get Hancock would have been the way to go. Tough to say. As far as who's available here, Riley Height is available. Hunter Brustewicz, who is real. Pretty sure he's going to be a medium four. There's Karki. Uh, Dragasevich. Don't believe is real. He might be, though. Yeah, he is, actually, because R.O.W. I guess I added him in. Let's see, you got Dwayne Paul. Which, I mean, damn, if he's a medium elite, how amazing would that be? Go to Tangay as a defenseman. And then there's Rob Sloan, who is likely to be a medium elite. Or we could take Flaherty, who we know for a fact is a medium elite. Hmm... If Tan Gabe was a medium elite, that'd be huge because we could really use another defensive prospect. Sloan, we don't even know for sure. I'd kind of like to take Stuart Flaherty just so that we 100% know for sure he's a medium elite. We know he's going to be a lower overall, but that's not a player who's going to be bad enough that I can never really justify abusing like the trading to get rid of him. It would be justified. Obviously, I'd just take him with the next pick if it was mine, but it's not. I'm going to go for the slam dunk. We're going to take Stuart Flaherty just to make sure we get a medium elite. Significantly a lower overall, but we'll see what happens next. Riley Heights off the board. Brustowitz is off the board. Cohen Zimmer or Zimmer. Karki. So this is Melnick's pick. I got a feeling he's going to go with that Ukrainian defenseman. And he does. So he gets us a 77 overall medium top four defenseman, which works out pretty well, in all honesty. Now, there, were, like I said, there were higher level players to select, but unless someone's a medium elite, I'm okay with having someone who has a higher value instead of a higher overall. Sloan at a 65 actually would have been the guy to go for, but it wasn't guaranteed. And then Detroit with that final selection... Selects Franzen. Go figure. Detroit selects a Franzen. So who's still on the board here? And that could potentially be a guarantee. You know, slam dunk here. LaRose I don't think is a slam dunk, but it could be nice. Brooks is definitely not a slam dunk, nor is Graves. Trading up here appears to be a decent option. I wish I knew for a fact that Burke Howell was a medium elite. Uh, Boma, very interesting player at 44, Dean Wynn, not that good, Jorgen Dahl, there's a goalie, Noah Valley, who I think is real, if I'm not mistaken, I recognize that name, that's not computer generated, that's going to be another damn good goalie that we could pick up, who is available just shy of where we're projected to select. And then there's another goalie here, Ernie Conley. 19 years old, though. That's a little bit scary. A lot of players here that we just don't know enough about to help make this draft worth it. Hmm. How I'd love to select LaRose. I just don't know if I want to trade up in this draft. I do, but I don't. 50th pick, we're on the 32nd. I am going to be lazy. I'm going to avoid trading up in hopes that I can get somebody half decent here. Value was a medium starter. 
A lot of medium top sixes, medium you know, top four defensemen. Although that was a bit of a minefield. The Rose was okay, but not amazing. So there's a chance here we can pull off a, a bit of a coup if this works out for me. Radek Atanovic could be half decent. Nick Eaves could be half decent as well. Two year, was that a two year ETA? Two year ETA, not confirmed. Could be very decent. Amadio, four year, four year. What else do we have here in terms of uh, projection? Corey Crawford comparison. One of those two goalies would be a pretty safe bet. Reese is a near, I mean, it's not confirmed, but a potential two year ETA. Got Sparks, Tanev. Okay. Big time risk that we've pulled off here. But like I said, we're going to see if it works out for me. I think I'm going to go with Radik Atanovic. Plays for Yager's team. I'm glad no. And Atanovic is at least a medium top six. So I'll take that. I'll take that. And then we get the 79th pick as well. Question is, did I miss out on anybody? And right now it is medium top nine forward city. Jesus. I had a weird feeling about this draft and a severe lack of confidence in our coaching staff. Conley was a medium elite goalie. I had a feeling he would be. Pretty happy with who we've ended up with in this draft. Especially in terms of, uh, you know, potential trade value. But that raises the question, who's next? Robioff, I don't trust that you're going to be half decent. There's Garvin, Mario LaBelle. A confirmed medium elite goalie Todd Locke, 6'4 at 20 years old. He's going to have a really high trade value. He's not going to be that great, but there's also no limitations on trade value. I'm allowed to exploit the AI if I want to. So Todd Locke is obviously going to be the pick. 58 overall medium elite. Don't mind if I do. We have another third round pick here. And we might as well sort by potential at this point. There's another medium elite goalie. It's Nick Staples, another overager. We will continue to abuse high medium elite trade values. And all of a sudden, this draft is looking pretty, pretty good. I did just ask, I didn't realize we had back to back picks, so I accidentally simmed that. Um, we took Nick Lidstrom. <laughs> so, you know, who's the real loser here? We drafted Nick Lidstrom. Eat your heart out, Detroit. Uh, Kozlov could be worth the risk. Phillips could be worth the risk as well. Camper, if I knew for a fact you weren't a low elite or a, a low top six, but I actually don't know for a fact he's a low top six. Damn. I have a feeling he is. There's Salvador Gamble, so if we don't want to take the gamble, we take Salvador. And then Dowell we don't know enough about. Hardigan we don't know enough about. So in terms, of, in terms of pinned players here, I think we go with either Camper, can't help but think he's a medium top nine gem, or we go with Gamble. I'm going to take the risk, and I'm going to go for Ray Camper and hope he's not a medium nine or a low top six. I crapped out. <laughs> Damn it. It's not all that surprising. Uh, Kozlov is off the board. We should... Still be able to get Gamble here. I would imagine. Gamble. Hey, so there we go. We we got both of them anyway. Gamble, a 57 overall medium top six player. Like I said, we have a lot of draft picks. We're adding a lot of new talent into the prospect pool at this stage. What else do we have here in terms of half decent players? Is there anybody? Who fits that description. Now might be the time to cash out. On this particular draft. I feel like we did pretty well for ourselves though. Harold. You're not any good. Damn Harold you blew it. Medium top nine to Kaiser. Hello to Kaiser. 19 years old. 3 year ET. I'm going to take a risk on this guy. He can't skate for shit. But you want to talk about a future fourth liner. 66 overall, medium top 9 in the 4th round. That's actually pretty good. That is actually pretty good. 
Anybody else who has a half decent overall at this point? You have Ashim who has a shot, but that's not going to help him. This goalie, Kevin Parent or Parant, not that great. Anybody else who just magically wants to have good overall? <laughs> Please? Goaltender, who I don't know how good he is. Whitaker's not that bad, but not that great either. Yeah, we found a pretty, uh, you know, good diamond in the rough of a medium elite there. Can't complain about that. Another medium fringe starter with a half decent overall, but nothing too special. And again, we just keep looking to see if there are any potentials, and uh, the answer is no. If we want someone with a good potential, we're just going to have to take a risk. All right, I think we are just about out on this draft, or we risk it. I mean, we're in the fourth round. If there was a time to risk it, now is it. In terms of just hoping for the best with some of these potentials. So we have a couple of medium elites who might be half decent. Krogue might be a decent low elite. A little bit tough to tell. Medium top six and Brzgalov potentially. It's not quite confirmed. A couple of medium top four hopefuls. Medium starter and then we have quite a few confirmed. Medium top nines, none of whom are going to have a great overall. So at least we have our best selections available to us here. And we are going to take the risk, first and foremost, with this 17-year-old player here, Pavel Chubarov. I don't trust that Clayton Foote's any good because he's way down in the 800s. I'm going to take a big risk, an off-the-board pick on Chubarov, and unsurprisingly, he's a little bit too far into the 200s to actually be half-decent, because that's just how the board works. So again, Foot not worth looking at, Hardigan not really worth looking at, Krogh is borderline, we'll go for it and just hope for the best. And we got it, so about 230 is the sweet spot, but Krogh is a low elite. Don't think he'll ever develop, but I'll take it. From here, what else do we have? Now it's the potential medium top six and Brzgalov, who will select 17-year-old Russian. Hey, look at that. This has been a really good draft for us. It's a little bit more conservative than I normally am with some of these picks, but knowing that I might kind of sort of blow up this team a little bit, we need uh, we need assets. And assets we shall have at the end of this. See if any of these uh, medium top four defensemen want to pay off. I know Bird's not going to. Uh, let's go for Daryl Peckham. Don't think he'll be any decent in terms of overall, but he could be decent in terms of potential. And he is another medium four. Damn, we are killing this draft right now. <laughs> This is exactly what we needed. We are absolutely killing this draft right now in terms of trade value. Uh, we'll go for our Tony Nurmi next. It was a 50 overall medium top 9, but medium 9 is worth more uh, you know, trade value-wise than the pick itself. So I don't hate it. Uh, next up, let's go for Ian Gentile. And Ian is a medium 7th, so... Uh, it's one of my first misses, you know, that medium bottom six as well. And, of course, the AI pick in Lidstrom will go for Moses Cuff over Rager, But he is a medium nine. Pick 124. My goodness, how many picks did we have in that fourth round? So who is next is the question. Who is next? So we know you're not worth it. Out of the medium elites, no real way to know. Some of these low elites have a little bit more of a shot at making it. As long as they're not listed up that highly. Which they're not. I don't have any faith in those medium top sixes. The low sixes are terrible. Okay. Well, at least we know who to go for. I'll say we'll uh, pin Hayden Tucker and Norm Voros there as well. And to be honest, these uh, are close to confirmed medium elites, except for Combs, who's terrible. Could also be worth it. 
This turned into a draft episode very quickly. So let's go with... Let's go with... I mean, we have a lot of low elites that we could take a risk on. And that is exactly what we're going to do. Let's take Vyacheslav Semen. The 18-year-old Latvian who is a low top nine. Okay. Well, the good thing is we're in the fifth round. So there's no point in really cashing out. We're just going to go for it. Let's take Alex Varlamov with this next pick. He is terrible as well. After that, who else is projected to go? It is Cesar Julian. Son of Claude. Get well soon, Claude. Uh, medium, bottom, six. So yeah, the value in this draft has completely fallen apart, but for the hell of it, we're going to keep trying. Harold Trajanovich is the pick. He is terrible. Yeah, we really should cash out at this stage. <laughs> we really should cash out, but I am uh, stubborn. Jonah Ricci is the pick. Jonah... You know, if just one of these players ends up being half decent, it makes this worth it. Unfortunately for myself, I don't see that happening. Allie McKenzie will be the pick. Low top six. Yep, this is bad, bad, bad. But after we select these players, we're certainly going to cash out. Let's go for Hayden Tucker. Guaranteed medium top nine. Decent value. Only a 60 overall, but it is what it is. Final pick of the fifth round is going to be... Who's it going to be? It's going to be Antropov. How good are you, Antropov? Low elite. There we go. <laughs> we get one more for the road. It's not too bad. We at least add somebody else. So I'll take it. Let's go ahead and select the Felipe Olet with this pick. Another low elite. Can we make it a hat trick? Can we hit the trifecta to end this draft? It's the last player I'm interested in. I mean, no, we can't because Storm Boros is a confirmed medium top nine. But hey, that's okay. We did incredibly well for ourselves. Let's cash out on these draft picks. There's nobody else who was really worth selecting. And with that, I am very, very happy. Oh my god, I own half the seventh round. <laughs> uh, with that, I am very, very happy with how this draft just went for us. I need a team who is willing to... Are we in the 2024 draft? We are. No, we're not. 2024 is next year. Okay, cool. Uh, I need a team that's willing to trade picks for next year. Anaheim, thank you for the fifth rounder. And Anaheim, how about... Eh, maybe not. Let's go to uh, Arizona. Nope, Boston. Perfect. Boston for their fifth rounder? No. So it is going to be a 6th and a 7th from them. Done deal. Okay, so we're out of this draft. $63 million. We're allowed to spend up to 78 mind you. We're still waiting to hear you know, from quite a few of our top players. The big thing... My God, we selected a lot of players. The big thing now is coaching staff. The big thing now is going to be coaching staff. There were a lot of draft pick trades. Justin Brahm was in that deal, too. So let's see what happens. So our goalie coach's deal is up. We got a lot of scouts whose deals are up. Koivula's back. Sabarin, Batherson, Formanton, Prosvetov, Bellarive, Lafreniere rejected. So that extended contract for Lafreniere doesn't go down as planned. Goaltending-wise, again, it's Kemper, Prosvetov, Wallstead needs to be signed. Drieger, as a result, has to be dropped, and Topita has to be signed as well. Those are the six goaltenders, unless something changes. And now, again, we have two medium elites in the system. Defensively, Gleason I'm going to drop. No reason to bring him back. The Abushkin is terrible. We're going to drop him as well. Federgradiv forever, I'll bring him back as an AHL option, maybe. Eh, we'll bring Feder back. We're going to drop Marcus Phillips, though. At least for the moment. Uh, I don't remember if Flynn was a Melnick pick or not. I'm going to drop him. If he was, I'm sorry. I feel like he was the guy where I was like, oh yeah, no, I'll just remember to re-sign him later, and then I didn't. <laughs> uh, Lafreniere, of course, is the big name right now. Might have been Petrangelo, too, but this guy's also trash. We're going to get rid of him. 
Left wing is Dustin Brown. Hate to tell you, you are gone. Volkov, hate to tell you. Man, when the hell were you drafted? 2021 seventh rounder. Well, no shock that he didn't make it. And then centers, Paquette, Carlson. You boys will be dropped. Cool. So right now it's just Lafreniere, mainly. Lafreniere and Federer Eve. Whoo! I don't know where Lafreniere wants a six-year deal. Well, that's good, but I'm not going to give you a six-year deal. I will give you a five-year deal. You need to accept the 85%, which would be 6725. And I am perfectly all right with that contract for Lafreniere. Will it go through is the question. Dopita signs. Gurdiv signs. Wallstead signs. Lafreniere rejects again. We'll qualify him. He doesn't want to sign an extension. So that raises the question. Are we losing Alexi Lafreniere? He doesn't want to re-sign. So I have to let him go to free agency. But then the question is, am I allowed to match the offer to keep him? I think I'm allowed to because he's an RFA. That just means, again, I lose the ability to get him for the price that I want him on. You could say, well, the rule is he has to take a pay cut and he won't be taking a pay cut. So that's going to be the big question heading into the next episode. Is Lafreniere going to be offer sheeted? And do we have to accept the offer sheet? Because I'm pretty sure that is exactly what is about to happen. And that is a horrifying, horrifying thought. As we're going to let go of these coaches as well. And we'll see who's out there on the open market. Let's sim to free agency. The coaching staff is something we're going to have to handle. And that's not going to be too fun. Scouting staff as well. It's going to have to be slightly adjusted. But then looking here... At who is available in free agency. Again, we can spend up to $78 million. So we have about $14 million. In terms of goaltenders. I mean, if we're not looking at RFAs, which we really don't want to get rid of our picks. I mean, Samsonov, Swayman. But, you know, big names out there like Ben Bishop. Eh, we don't want to pay that much money. And then, you know, backup goaltender-wise like Varlamov would be great. But I'm pretty sure we're just going to stick with Prosvetov. There's no reason not to. And if you look at prospects that are actually available, uh, I mean, Blackwood's not much of a prospect anymore. There are two medium starter goalies, but I'd have to move somebody to sign them. Defensively, we do need help defensively, but there's not great help here. I don't think we want to pay Risto that much money. I mean, Risto, Dumba, Severson, Vince Dunn, and Mackenzie Weger there. Pretty good value for money for him. But then we're looking at guys like Alexiak, Ben Sherratt, bringing back Dylan DeMello. It's a good thing, you know, our top four is pretty much set. But without Borowiecki, who looks like he resigned in New York, that's not going to get any easier. And then obviously David Posternock, I don't have the ability to sign. Question is whether or not we even need any of these top players. Patch Reddy, Bjorkstrand, these are guys that could be signed on... Uh, Decent little contracts here. So at the very least, you've seen who's out there. The question is, though, as we look at our roster, you know, where's where's the help? And again, I can't help but think we're going to change the coach if someone's available. But looking here, we have to figure out what's going to happen with Lafreniere. Goaltending-wise, I feel fine with what we have. Defensively, our top four is set, but we need some depth. Absolutely need some depth. And forward-wise, it's one, two, three, four, potentially five, six, seven, eight, nine. Forward-wise, we're going to be okay. A lot of big decisions to make here in Ottawa. I want your input. What do you think we should do? What happens to Lafreniere? And, of course, as always, let me know your suggestions for the controversy wheel because that's going to be a thing in the next episode as well. Until then, have a good one. Take it easy. Pray for us.